thing. So when you hear these numbers and these statistics increasing at an alarming rate, the question should be, you know, why? What, what is actually happening? So that's what I wrote the whole book about or part of the book about. Um, but most people are told that these are purely genetic disorders, that um, there's really no hope because your child has a genetic disorder and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, many professionals believe that, and that's why they don't really try very hard because they figure, what am I going to do anyway? It's a genetic disorder. And so in school and in the healthcare system, we have what we call a compensatory model. The model is we can only compensate, we can't remediate, we can't fix these problems, we can only help to, you know, compensate for the disability and try to minimize that disability over the child's lifespan. Um, now, the reason why we believe that is because um, in the 70s, there were studies that were, the first study was called a twin study that was done in uh, autistic children looking at twins and looking at fraternal and identical twins. Um, they had a very small sample size of only 14 children, but what they found at that point was that 90% of the identical twins had autism and uh, only about 15% of the fraternal twins had autism. So from that one study, today you still hear people say that autism is the most highly inheritable disorder that we know of because there have been about 20, 25 studies since then that have reproduced that study to a certain degree, but all with very small sample size. However, last year in Stanford, the largest study that was ever done on 192 pairs of twins was done and they found the opposite. They found that it was actually higher in fraternal twins than it was in identical twins. Um, and they stated that the contribution of a child having autism was 60% environmental and only 40% genetic. Um, so what we also know is that over the past 25 years, 95% of the research dollars has been looking for bad genes and we've yet to actually find it in any of these disorders. Um, we know that some children with genetic disorders like Down syndrome, Fragile X, tuber sclerosis may also be labeled with autism or ADHD or OCD or Tourette's, but that is not typically, you know, when we look at children that don't have a clear-cut genetic disorder, when we look at those children, we don't see any clear genetic mutations. And when people call something a genetic disorder, what they generally mean is that there's something wrong with the DNA. We haven't been able to find that, and now what most people believe is that there isn't any. And what we're actually looking at is what we call an epigenetic problem, which means essentially that the problem is primarily environmental. It's an environmental disorder because there is no such thing as a genetic epidemic. In fact, Francis Collins, who was the actual architect of the Human Genome Project, probably knows about as much about genes as almost anybody, um, actually testified in front of the Senate committee three and a half years ago saying that the rise in autism is due to changes in the environment. He went on to say that genes alone don't tell the whole story, that the recent increases in chronic diseases like diabetes, childhood asthma, obesity, and autism are actually cannot be due to major shifts in, gene, in the gene pool because that takes too long for that to happen. Um, they must be due to changes in the environment including diet and physical activity. So what he's actually stating is that the environmental factors are primarily lifestyle factors. Things like level of exercise, what we eat, the level of stress hormones that we have, the inflammation in our body, um, you know, what we put in our body, what we expose it to, how we interact with other people. Are we social? Are we on internet? Are we on the uh, iPhone or, or texting people? Those things are actually a bigger factor than things like plastics or pesticides or drugs in our environment. Those things are factors, but the lifestyle factors are probably even more significant. And the good news about this is that we can modify those factors and because the genes themselves aren't actually damaged, they're just turned off we can actually turn them back on at a given time if we do the right thing. So the idea that autism, ADHD, all of these disorders are purely genetic, based on genetic mutations, and that there's nothing we can do about it, is no longer looked as an accurate theory that's in the scientific literature. That you'll see that everybody is talking about epigenetics, and what that means is that environmental factors are turning off or not turning on genes 
that should turn on during development, that it's affecting the developmental trajectory of the growth and development of the brain, especially in what we call functional connections or functional connectivity. That is the leading theory at this point in time, even though I will tell you that very few people know that. Um, in fact, you know, almost every audience I go to, I usually ask them to, you know, yeah, I kind of just gave, gave it away for you, but usually what I do is say, how many people feel that they could stand up right now and explain to me what's actually happening in the brain of a child with ADHD and autism? So before I kind of let it slip, how many of you think that you could have stood up and given me a plausible theory or uh, understanding of what is actually happening in the brain of a child with one of these developmental disabilities? How many people could have done that? Okay. And how many, just so we make sure that you're not all just a bunch of shy people, how many people couldn't have done that? Okay, good. So virtually nobody in the audience could and almost everybody could not which is where every level of lecture I go to, whether it's PhDs, whether it's a group of, I lectured at Stony Brook Medical School recently to a bunch of MDs and uh, people that were in the out there professions, PhDs, psychologists, neuropsychologists, for the most part, as well as educators and especially parents, whenever I ask that question, the answer is exactly the same. So that's a problem, right? I mean, when the majority of people working with these disorders or the majority of people that are parents of children with these disorders have no idea what the actual problem is, it's no wonder why it's increasing. This is why nobody expects it to stop. And so what I want to do is actually get that main point across to you tonight. And that's really where it all, start, it all started with brain balance, with that question. That's where it started with me. I was an academic. I was a clinician. Uh, I was, you know, involved in neurology and rehabilitation, and uh, I have children. I was a parent with children, and I had questions for myself and my own son, and I wanted to know what's actually happening in the brain. What is ADHD? And no one could tell me, and it really frustrated me, so I ended up doing my own research, and then I ended up hooking up with one of the leading researchers in the world, and he kind of, you know, had helped explain it with me. Um, but again, understanding the problem and how it is critical because that's the only way we can understand what can cause it and what can actually correct it. So these problems are related to what we call epigenetics and that means that they are potentially correctable. Now this was the cover of Time Magazine um, a couple of years ago. So it says right on the cover, the new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. Because what we know about epigenetics is uh, very interesting, is that we used to believe that if we saw something that was passed through families, that the only way you could do that was if you actually had a change in the physical DNA. We know that people throughout their life get what we call methyl marks, or kind of like black spots that are on your own genes. And they turn off your genes. But you know, for most people, it doesn't have that much of an effect on you. And we used to believe that during the point of conception that all those black spots, basically all the sins of the parents were wiped clean and the child started with a clean genetic slate. We now know that that's not the case. That many of these methyl marks that are turning off the gene in the parent can be passed on through multiple generations. This article goes on to talk about how we've been able to show it up to 11 generations. So, you know, what we see is that it can look like a genetic disorder. It can be passed on through multiple generations. But when we look at something like autism, again, the idea that it's genetic doesn't always fit because we know that virtually no parent of a child with autism has autism. I'll say that again. Virtually no parent of a child with autism has autism themselves.